On August 26, 2017, amateur radio operators from all over Finland participated in an emergency communications exercise called ILMI, India Lima Mike India. This training scenario was designed to mimic the results of a terrorist attack on grid communications and infrastructure, leaving amateur radio operators the task of augmenting emergency communications and creating a communications network nationwide throughout this training scenario. For this training scenario, we're going to be testing Winlink Express. Now, this Winlink video is probably going to be different than other Winlink videos you've seen before. That's because we're trying to replicate the conditions of a real-world terror attack on communications and power infrastructure. Surprisingly, the lack of power and grid communications were the least of the challenges that we had during the exercise. Alright guys, this is going to be a long one, but if you're interested in seeing Winlink implemented and used in a real-world environment, stick around and let's get started. You are listening to the emergency broadcast systems. This station broadcasts emergency news and official information on the air for a sign there. So this is my very first time using Winlink Live. And I'm glad I had this opportunity as a novice with Winlink because each time I use Winlink after this point, I'm going to start losing the objectivity that I have with it. And in regards to making this video, the objectivity that I have right now is far more valuable than a training video done in the vacuum of space without any of the real world problems. As I mentioned in the introduction, we're operating as if there's been an attack on grid communications and grid power. In response to those attacks, emergency service volunteers are being deployed by VAPEPA. In addition to emergency services, amateur radio operators are also being activated. Amateur radio operators will deploy field stations. They'll also deploy supporting fixed stations, collect and disseminate news, weather, and information, or relay that news, weather, and information of direct communications with other activated operators fails, and augment the communications for local emergency services. Now let's talk a little about my operating conditions. I use the Yaesu FT817ND. I use the broadband terminated dipole you saw from my ALE video. I used a 50 watt homebrew amplifier, a Winlink Express running on a netbook, and I did it all with solar power. Now there was also a contingency plan if this were a live scenario and operating a fixed station became a safety concern. And if that were the case, I would take my extended field communications kit out to the field, set up, and continue to operate from there. I would normally leave you to the end of the video before I showed you any results, but there's no need to do that now. We actually had some good results, or at least I did. Uh, I haven't seen the reports from the other operators yet, but the results were positive in my opinion. By the end of the event, I received a total of 12 messages. All of them were received via HF radio. I was also able to relay one message to Oscar Hotel 7, Joliet Papa, and get a response from him. That was also done on HF. I also received one message from outside of the disaster zone from Kilo Bravo 3, Quebec Echo Mike, who unwittingly became a participant in the emergency exercise. Finally, I was able to send a total of 11 messages during the event. I think it's important to keep this video real, so we're going to discuss some of the operational challenges I experienced during the event. By far, the biggest challenge of the day was QRM from RTTY and SSB contesters. Now, because we were only in a training scenario, this wasn't really a big deal. However, consider for a moment what a big deal it would have been had this been an actual emergency and we couldn't get the message through. The next operational challenge has to do with relaying messages into and out of the disaster zone. Looking at the map on the left, the white circle indicates my NVIS zone. 
I can usually communicate on 80 or 40 meters with any station within that circle, provided we are both using some sort of NVIS compatible antenna system. In contrast, the map on the right shows you my location in Oulu, Finland. It also shows you the location of Hotel Bravo 9 Alpha Kilo in Switzerland. Hotel Bravo 9 Alpha Kilo was the only RMS station I was able to make effective and consistent communications with throughout the exercise. So where's the problem? Firstly, I was well beyond ground wave range with the majority of stations that were in the south. So in the perfect world, I would have preferred to see 40 and 80 meter RMS stations set up with NVIS capabilities. Taking that a bit further, I would even go as far as to say 40 and 80 meter RMS stations here in the center of Finland in Oulu so that communications can be established or linked between the north and the south. If I can find the financing to do so, I'll implement the 40 meter station myself. Finally, some sort of guide or comms plan so that all of the wind link or radio operators will be in the same place on the same band at the same time for effective comms. There's no need to cover that here, so I'll go ahead and write a blog post about it in the coming weeks. The next challenge I had was updating the channel tables over the internet or over the radio. Of course, now I know that these tables should be routinely updated, but as a noob, I didn't know that, and uh, my first try in a grid-down scenario, I couldn't update the tables because I had no internet. That's actually fine because Winlink has a backup facility allowing you to update the tables over the radio. Unfortunately, before I could send that message out so that I could update the tables over radio, I had to scroll through the tables to find a station that could actually hear me, send the message, and then wait to get the reply and update the tables. Firstly, I need to point out this was very slow and frustrating. But even worse, it introduced a non-real-time aspect to Winlink, which didn't have to be there. A few episodes ago, I introduced a broadband terminated dipole for ALE. In that video, I discussed how ALE band scanning works and how it alleviates the need for forecasting that we have in Winlink. I'll put a link right here and uh, you can take a look at that video if you're interested. Still, the good news is this was a training scenario and I learned a lot about Winlink. We're going to stay on the topic of channels and RMS stations for a second. Uh, the next challenge I had was finding a reliable RMS station. Armed with the experience of this exercise, I now realize that forecasting is not the best way to find the most reliable RMS station. In fact, based on the experience I had in this exercise, I'm more inclined to simply sort the list by station range from me and look at the type of antenna configuration that I'm using at the moment to find the most likely station to use. In my opinion, that was much more effective than using the forecasting. Now the last thing I have on my list of operational challenges is RMS station density. Regardless of where we look, there are always clusters of stations packed together. So the way RMS stations are distributed now, we have areas with excellent coverage and then we have large empty areas with no coverage at all. As you can see, this is also true in Europe. Africa, the Middle East, Southeast Asia, they all suffer in the same way. But really, the point of the exercise was Finland. Realistically, I would like to have connected to stations in Sweden and Norway for emergency communications outside of the disaster zone. Because of the QRM problem that I had, it was impossible to connect to those stations reliably. My solution for this would be encouraging operators to put up emergency RMS or BBS link stations. Unfortunately, RMS stations are all operating on unique frequencies and themselves create QRM for other digital operators. So perhaps the right answer is putting up emergency stations according to a communications plan during a disaster. Now since the south of Finland was so well covered already, I would really like to see a station in Vasa, a station in Oulu, which is probably myself, and then a station up there with Santa Claus and Rovaniemi. 
The proximity of these stations to one another, as well as their proximity to other stations outside of Finland, would help meet the goals of the exercise, as well as provide low-power field operators the option to connect to stations closer to them while they're out in the field. Now we arrive at my final thoughts. First of all, I see a lot of advantages with Windlink, so I'm definitely willing to participate in another emergency training scenario. Regarding contest or QRM, I would really like to see backup channels on work bands to augment the 40 and 80 meter channels we're already using. Briefly going back to this point on station density, it would be amazing and beneficial to get stations in Vasa, Olu, and Rovaniemi as well. I'm already in the planning stages of implementing an ALE pilot station in Olu. Perhaps we can go ahead and do a RMS gateway as well. Finally, one of the features I was seriously missing with Winlink was keyboard to keyboard chat or instant messaging. I'm really hoping the RDOT project will bring something to the table for that. Before I go, I thought I'd remind you about www.oh8stn.org. Top articles on the website at the moment are the MCHF RS918 SSB clone, the DIY magnetic loop antenna project, the MAM portable off-grid power for ham radio series, and the Android powered Mini 60 antenna analyzer. And that's about it. Huge shout out to everyone who supports me on Patreon and PayPal and the people who share my videos. For everyone else, a comment and a thumbs up goes a long way to motivate me for the next video. Rock and roll guys. Thanks for watching. Ciao.